Welcome to the Hillsdale Online Courses Podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Juan, and we are here on the last lecture of this course on the Second World Wars taught by Victor Davis Hansen and Dr. Larry Piarn. And Dr. Hansen today will speak about the ends of the war. One of the things that uh, sticks out to me about this lecture is he brings basically to a close this question of strategy. We've looked at the different strategies of the Allies and the Axis powers in the different areas on, on the air, on water, on, on the earth. And what Dr. Hansen shows is that one, the strategies chosen by one side ended up being superior to the strategies uh, chosen by the other side. And uh, essentially that is what allows them in a sense to, to win the war. And then Juan, what I really liked is that Dr. Hansen then points to the more complicated question, which is, did the allied powers gain their objectives in this war? And if we look back at lecture one and Dr. Arn's introduction to this course, it becomes a pretty complicated question, uh, especially if you think of of it as defeating totalitarian governments, right? On the one hand, uh, we succeeded in toppling Adolf Hitler's Nazi Nazi regime and the military tyranny in Japan. On the other hand, we face a post-World War II world in which our former ally, the Soviet Union, becomes a growing and more powerful menace. Uh, that threatens liberty, not only uh, in Europe, uh, but throughout the world. And so Dr. Hansen grapples with that question and helps explain the the key decisions after World War II in confronting this new mes- menace and the nature and shape of the world after after this cataclysmic conflict. And just a quick personal note before we start today's podcast. If you want a chance to redo a course maybe that you slept through in college or you didn't give your best in high school, uh, we have some solutions. Uh, You can go to hillsdale.edu slash course and browse any of our 40 free online courses. You can pick up something new about philosophy, uh, read that great book that you've been avoiding, uh, dive deeper into American history. All of that is free and available for you at hillsdale.edu slash course. And now, Dr. Hanson. In our final lecture, we need to sum up World War II and discuss whether it was worth it, who won really the peace and who lost it, and what was the ultimate fate of those nations who fought it. The first question that looms over all others, did World War II end in the way that people had imagined, or particularly, did the winning side gain their objectives? If those objectives are defined in one particular manner, the answer is no, and another yes. Let's look at the failures of the Allied causes. World War I had promised us a perpetual peace. The Versailles Treaty was a way to make sure that the war would end all other wars, and it failed, the League of Nations failed. In World War II, there was an optimism that the Allies were fighting for the Four Freedoms, or they were fighting for the Atlantic Charter, or that they were going to rehabilitate Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union would be a partner and they would have so much power, these three powerful nations, that they could adjudicate the post-war world in a positive sense. So then World War II would sort of be the real war to end all wars. At least that was the idea of the UN Charter. That, of course, was a failure. The more people have been killed in wars since World War II than the 65 million who perished in that terrible six-year period. The United Nations, while some may argue is an improvement on the League of Nations by fact that it still exists and the way the League of Nations became obsolete and was ended by World War II, has not been able to either provide a moral or ethical model for governance on a global scale much less has it been able to stop wars from breaking out or ending them when they do break out. It is not a coalition of democratic nations. It is a coalition of often authoritarian governments in which true democracies are in the minority. And many of its resolutions hardly are what we would call classically liberal. They're mean-spirited, they're punitive, and they're counterproductive. So the United Nations, if that was the purpose 
of World War II is to make a perfect peace that failed. If the purpose of World War II was to end authoritarianism, especially totalitarianism, then it failed. Because think of it this way, Britain declared war in Germany on September 2nd, 1939 to preserve the freedom of Poland, and that is to stop German totalitarianism from absorbing Poland in the way that it had absorbed Czechoslovakia and in the way that it had undermined nations like Romania and hung Hungary. World War II ended by turning those countries over to the Soviet Union. And so we substituted, if I could be so general and so sloppy in terminology, we substituted a right-wing totalitarianism for a left-wing totalitarianism. In terms of blood on one's hands, Stalin, who had been knee-deep in the collectivizations of the 1920s, the show trials, the execution, of the Russian military classes, of Polish civilians. He had more blood on his hands than Hitler did. And yet, World War II ensured that the Soviet Union would now control Eastern Europe. That was not the objective. And so in that way, World War II failed again. If the objective of World War II, however, on the other hand, was to stop Nazi Germany, to stop Italian fascism, and to stop Japanese militarism, and to pre prevent them from killing millions of people, it sort of failed too, at least in the sense that it only stopped them after 50 to 55 million Chinese, Russians, Eastern Europeans, and Western Europeans had died. In other words, Given the power of the Soviet Union that was displayed during the war and the power of the British Empire and the power of the United States, one asks, why couldn't that power have been expressed earlier in 1938, 39, 40, and it would have precluded the Axis head start or at least their ability to kill so many unarmed people. Had the United States had the military power that it had in 1943, in 1939, had Britain had the power it displayed in 44, had it had that in 36, maybe we wouldn't have had place names like Belsen or Treblinka or Auschwitz. Maybe six million Jews would be alive today because the Third Reich wouldn't have dared try to start a war with such powerful allies. In that sense, the agendas of World War II were a failure. But that said, if the agenda was to stop a costly mistake, that is, that prior European appeasement, prior American isolationism, prior Russian collusion out of naivete, self-interest, selfishness, laxity, any term you want to use might apply to the attitudes of the Allies prior to the war. Despite all that, if they finally wised up in the case of Britain in 39, the case of the United States in 41, and the case of the Soviet Union in 41, and they saw that they were facing an existential threat in fascism and Nazism and Japanese militarism, and an existential threat that had a head start, and the purpose was to stop that, then World War II was a success. And remember how close they came to failing. At least in 1941, when the final alliance between the Soviet Union, United States, and the British Empire was cemented, it wasn't the end of the war. They were so far behind, and they were gonna to have to suffer so many losses that for a brief moment, perhaps six months of 1942, the Axis still had a chance to win, given all their advantages. After all, they had all of Europe that consists now of the European Union, which is the largest GDP in the world. They had all of that under Axis control. And if you look at the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, from the Indian Ocean to the Aleutians, and from Wake Island to Mongolia, all of that area was on the Japanese control. It was even larger than Europe. 
and most of the people in the world were under Axis domination. Think of capitals that we, we think of today as the, the stellar cities of the world, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Paris, Athens, Rome, Budapest, Prague, Shanghai, whatever we use, Beijing, m much less Rome, Tokyo, Berlin, Cologne, Frankfurt, all of these cities were either under Axis domination or in case of places like Stockholm or Helsinki or Lisbon or Madrid, they were allied to the Axis. And yet that was somehow stopped. Now, for a while it didn't seem that way. If we looked at the map of the world in late 1942, at least late summer, Tobruk had fallen the Africa Corps was on its way to Alexandria and on into Suez. The Japanese had landed in Guadalcanal. They were about ready by September 1942 to cut off Australia completely from American uh, supply. Remember that Singapore was gone, Manila was gone, the Philippines were, they were all Japanese dominated territories. And when we look at the, the war on the Eastern Front, Army Group South, we think that, well, they didn't take Moscow and Leningrad, so the war was over. No, in spring, summer of 1942, Army Group South was bombing the Grozny oil fields. They were only 100 miles from the Caspian Sea. A German expeditionary force had already climbed the Caucasus Mountains to plant a Nazi flag. And it looked like they were gonna control all of the oil and natural gas and strategic materials in the Soviet Union. So for a brief moment, it looked like the Allied agenda had failed. And then suddenly, Allied economic power, military acumen, uh, high technology kicked in, and we, we now associate that with stellar battles such as El Alamein, the American First Division on Guadalcanal, the nightmare at Stalingrad. And so by early 1943, the tide at Erokovit turned uh, in the Allies' interest. So let's sum up what I mean. If the purpose of World War II was for Allied democracies and the Soviet Union to come to their senses and realize the wages of their naivete, and in some cases collaboration as far as it regards the Soviet Union, and then catch up and win and destroy this great plague on humanity. The war was a st stunning success and it was waged in the case of the United States and the United Kingdom in a brilliant fashion that mitigated losses. If we ask ourselves, and how did they do it? Why did the Allies win? And I think there's three or four pretty compelling reasons that would tell us that once that alliance was formed, in December of 1941, there was a very good chance if they made the right decisions that they were gonna win the war. The first is that there were two billion people alive on the planet in 1941. And when Hitler made the foolish decision in June 21st to invade the Soviet Union and add that to the list of enemies along with China, and he had earlier attacked not Great Britain, but the British Empire. And then when he attacked the United States, uh, declared war on it, I should say, in December 11th of 1941, he changed the strategic calculus. In other words, instead of having market advantage over the sole surviving member of the democracies, Great Britain, which he pretty much uh, had isolated and cornered by late June of 1940, with its 45 million people versus the entire population of Europe under German control, as well as soon Japan. He flipped that calculus, and suddenly instead of 45 million people in resistance, there was nearly 400. And when you count China and India, essentially half the world's population was pitted against the Axis powers. In terms of the economy, the allied economies were very closely integrated. The Soviet Union came to the United States after December of 1941 and says, 
we don't need you to build us tanks. We, you know what, we don't really need the Shermans. We'll take some of your obsolete planes, but what we want to do is free our industry up to make what we do best. And those are steel, heavy steel products, troop things that, uh, rifles, machine guns, mortars, uh, or heavy artillery, tanks, motorized artillery, rockets, and but we don't do other things. We don't make rations very well. We don't make shoes very well. We don't have enough uniforms. We don't have enough radios. We don't have enough radar sets. We don't really have, have not really mastered uh, the smelting of aluminum. If you could bring that to us, it would free us. So there was a close integration. If we look at how the economy was uh, managed and organized in the United States, it, it baffles the imagination because we had here under the New Deal a neo-socialist agenda. So everybody thought when the war broke out, FDR, the architect of the New Deal, would say, we're going to have a command economy and the state armories or the state factories are going to produce goods and services. In fact, he did just the opposite. He made a war production board and he gave powers over to capitalists like Henry Kaiser, the great steel magnate and shipbuilder, Henry Ford, the automotive wizard, William Knudsen, the architect of the American automobile industry, and he gave them powers that capitalism had never had before or since. So if they wanted to go into the Bay Area and just put pretty much level homes and make a assembly line to produce Liberty ships in Oakland or in Seattle, they got, they, got a free, they got a free ticket to do that. If Henry Ford said, I can build a, a B-24 one an hour, but I need that Willow One plant, I just need to demolish everything and I need to override all county, local zoning, jurisdiction, they gave him that idea. If we wanted to build a bomb, we wanted to basically carve out a whole sovereign area of New Mexico and turn it over to particular contractors, we did. And that was a, uh, an unprecedented move. And the result of it was that the United States that had only used about 50% of its industrial capacity due to the second half of the Great Depression and had about 10 to 12% of its workforce idled, suddenly created rates of economic growth that we've never seen since, 7, 10, 12% per annum GDP. So that by the end of 1945, the American economy alone in today's dollars was about a trillion and a half dollars of goods and services and output. And it was larger than the British, the Russian, the German, the Italian, Japanese economies put together. And in 1944, it was almost, had almost reached that level of productivity. The same was true in the United Kingdom. Uh, Churchill allowed private enterprise, Lord Beaverbrook, to go into the aircraft industry and to say, this is a contract to a particular company and go make a profit and, and build airframes. And the result was that in the worst hours of the Blitz of 1940, the British industrial sector was producing more supermarine fighters, Spitfires, than was Germany with all of occupied Europe under its hold producing BF-109 fighters. How do you explain that? And the answer is that the Allies uh, integrated their economies and they, in, the term, in terms of the United Kingdom and the United States, they allowed private enterprise to be fully uh, independent almost or autonomous. You would think that right-wing national socialists would do the same, but until the advent of Albert Speer, uh, there was something, I guess the worst example of crony capitalism was in Hitler's Germany. Hitler handed out contracts based on romance, on cronyism, on bribery. Uh, the entire Third Reich was not a modern, efficient economy. It was an ossified, calcified, medieval structure. So if Hitler wanted to relieve a ger general and he was afraid he might start a coup, he gave him an estate in Pomerania in a way that would be unthinkable in the United Kingdom. The same was true of Italy and Japan. They did not turn their economies over to private interest and the central government tried to adjudicate how they produce goods and services and they weren't as efficient. It's no secret that Americans are more divided than ever. 
And it's not just over what policies will improve our great country. No, it's over whether America is great at all, whether America deserves our love. That's why Imprimus is so important. Imprimus looks at the issues of the day from a constitutional perspective, reminding citizens always of our great heritage of liberty. For more than 50 years, Imprimus has featured speeches from the smartest conservative thinkers and writers at Hillsdale events. These days, Hillsdale publishes people like Molly Hemingway, Andy Puzder, Harmeet Dillon, and Chris Rufo. Over 6.4 million American households and businesses receive Imprimus absolutely free. And I urge you to sign up for it today at no charge. To get your free lifetime subscription, go to Hillsdale. Dot edu slash lifetime right now. Or text the word Imprimus to 71844 and we'll send you a link to sign up for your free lifetime subscription. That's I-M-P-R-I-M-I-S to 71844. On this topic number two of cooperation, it transcended economic cooperation. The Allies were strategically coordinated, and they were coordinated in terms of sharing military expertise and military technology. I'll give you an example first of the reverse. When Hitler was preparing to invade the Soviet Union, the most momentous decision of the war, did he consult his ally Mussolini and his soon-to-be ally, the Japanese, no. And by that I mean Mussolini invaded the Balkans, Yugoslavia, and sort of got himself into a mess at the very time Hitler was preparing to go in to the Soviet Union. That caused a lot of diversion of forces, turmoil, and disrupted the central planning. Did Hitler, in response, tell Mussolini when he was going to go into the Soviet Union? No. He asked him for an Italian for an Italian contingent, and that would ultimately grow to 160,000 Italians went into Russia, which they had no beef with, they did not want to fight, and they came at the expense of sorely needed Italians in Greece, the Balkans, and North Africa. Again, no cooperation, but utter distrust. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, nobody in the German high command knew that it was going to be attacked by Japan, and more importantly, they didn't even know where it was. The Japanese, in turn, in April of 1941, had cut a non-aggression pact with the Russians. Think of that for a minute. In 60 days, their ally, Nazi Germany, is going to invade the Soviet Union. And what better strategy would there have been for the Japanese to land at Vladivostok and attack from east and west? And then Stalin would have never been able to transfer 25 crack Pacific divisions all the way to Moscow to stave off the siege of Moscow in November and December of 1941. Instead, the Japanese cut a deal and they cut the legs right out from under any idea of a, of a coordinated strategy. Was that justified? No. But it was understandable? Yes. Why? Because the Japanese had been fighting in August and September of 1939 against Mar who, who would later become Marshal Zhukov. And what happened? On August 23, 1939, the arch anti-communist Hitler cuts a deal with Stalin and frees up Stalin to destroy the Japanese who have to withdraw in, in shameful defeat. So there was always mutual suspicion among the three Axis powers. And this is quite ironic, it's paradoxical because after all, they all have shared ideologies. They're fascists, they're Nazis, they're militarists. Why wouldn't they coordinate? And, you know, it's not just ex explicable by distance. Tokyo is as far from Berlin as Moscow is from the United States. It's more that fascism itself, or Nazism, or whatever term we use for these right-wing authoritarians, if they're right-wing, because they use the word socialist a lot in their nomenclature, it's, a, it, it's inherently a distrustful ideology. It abhors transparency, and it's suspicious not just of enemies, but of friends. There's a reason why Hitler's greatest admiration was not for necessarily Mussolini or Tojo, but for his archenemy, Stalin.
He said that when he won the war, he would hang Churchill and Roosevelt, but he would give a state for Stalin to be, have a glorious retirement. Why? Because he was with an iron fist, uh, was able to destroy dis all dissent and create a command economy in, in Russia and make it a major power, something that Hitler admired. In contrast, among the Allies, when we wanted to go into D-Day, it was an Anglo-American operation. We planned very closely. We even talked to Joseph Stalin and we said, we're going to invade in June. Operation Bagration will come from the east and we will have a sort of pincers against the Third Reich. When we looked at the canvas of World War II, we said, do not tell the Soviet Union they need to have a strategic bombing uh, arm or submarine arm or surface navy arm or send divisions to Italy or have a presence in North Africa or in 43 or 44, help us with island hopping. We said, your task is to destroy the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front and thereby the Wehrmacht in general. We want you to destroy German ground forces, and they did that very well at a, a terrible cost. Meanwhile, we were the out, that we outsourced all of naval and air operations to the Allies, and we worked very closely together. It was even so close a relationship. Think about the cooperation down to the level of military technology. The Japanese could have really used the technology that made a BF-109 fighter. It was never transferred. There were U-boat technologies that could have been very valuable, very much needed uh, with the Japanese submarine force, never transferred. German torpedoes didn't work very well in 1939 and 40. The best torpedo in the world was the oxygen-fueled Long Tom. There was never any shared expertise. That only came much later and, and, and just dribbled out. And so there was never a coordinated arrangement where an Axis inventor or an Axis industrialist is say, I've got a tank or I've got an airplane that we can all use. In contrast, the Allies work very differently. So we, in 19, late 43 and early 44, we have this wonderful airframe design for the P-51 Mustang. It's going to be the generic fighter of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, for, till the end of the war. But the problem is it doesn't perform as we thought it was, especially at high, high altitudes. The Allison engine is not quite what we need. The Pratt Whitney engine won't work. But the Royals Royce Merlin engine that's in the Spitfighter, when you put it into an American airframe, it'll become the fastest and best fighter of the war. Another example, the Sherman is de dependable as tanks go. It's generic, you can put a crane on it, you can put a tow hitch on it, you can put a minesweeper on it, you can put rhino blades to knock out the hedgerows, but it has a 75 and then later a 76 millimeter short barreled gun and it can't penetrate a Tiger or Panther tank. And when we get to D-Day, this is apparent. So what do the British do? They say, you know, we have a 17 pounder long barreled roughly equivalent to 76 millimeter, but high velocity gun with a huge shell in it. And if we put this long gun under your turret, we could make the Sherman, despite its inefficiencies, we could make it able to destroy a Tiger tank or a Panther tank at great distances. And so here we are taking Shermans and giving them to the British and they're giving us the 17 pound and the result is something called the Firefly and that allows a Sherman tank, if you have one Firefly to every five tanks, that says, there's a Tiger, there's a Panther, bring the Firefly up and it will blow them apart. And actually, that's who killed Michael Whitman, the greatest Panzer ace of World War II. He was blown up probably by a Canadian Sherman Firefly tank. One final example, we were replacing second generation fighters with third generation in the Pacific and specifically the Hellcott and the Corsair fighter. And we wanted to put them on carrier decks. For a variety of reasons, American aviators preferred the Hellcat. Now, the, the Corsair, the Vought Corsair was almost comparable or maybe in some ways superior. And we said to our Marine Corps, well, naval aviators don't like the Corsair. It's, it's a little bit unwieldy and has characteristics of landing and taking off. They're not 
quite familiar with, we'll let the Marines use it. So it was a good system for us, but we kind of lost a great plane that could have been very valuable. Then we went to the British and said, this Corsair would work, but we have some problems with it. The British made modifications and it became their premier fighter off British aircraft carriers. And that was just characteristic of the Allied cooperation that was entirely absent on the part of the Axis. Why was that? And I think the answer, I don't want to be too chauvinistic about democracy over all other forms of government, but the major belligerents, Italy, Germany, and Japan were all Axis, authoritarian, totalitarian, unfree governments. The Allied triad had the Soviet Union, which was a ruthless dictatorship, but it had two uh, Republican or Democratic governments, parliamentary governed Britain and democratically governed or Republican governed the United States. And just the fact that you had two transparent so uh, societies out of three allowed a greater level of trust. We didn't trust Joseph Stalin completely, but there was greater trust between Stalin and us and us and Stalin because we were democratic. So that made a great difference, the fact that we had two democracies in our triad of allies, and the Axis triad had no democracies, which ensured greater distrust. There were two other reasons why the Allies won World War II and won it in such a relatively brief time. The Allies were not as ideological in the sense of ideologically constrained as were the Axis power. I know that Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union were totalitarian communists, but that was one of three members. And Stalin adapted in a realistic fashion by 1942 by outsourcing many of the military decisions to empirical commanders in a way that he had not in early 42 and late 41. And by ideologically constrained, what I mean is that take the Third Reich, it invested military resources and non-military operations. Take the Holocaust. Dozens of rail cargoes every day were going out of Western Europe and later Eastern Europe into the death camps at the expense of scarce transport to the Eastern Front. A huge uh, amount of German manpower was devoted to the Gestapo, and coercive secret services to root out Jews. And if you read Mein Kampf carefully in the second book and read sort of the rantings of Heydrich and Ribbentrop and especially nutty people like Alfred Rosenberg, you start to see that certain military traditions make sense because they were ways to round up Jews or supposed inferior people. And that was one of the agendas of the war. In fact, as the war became clearly lost in the minds of German architects of the conflict, they would privately in their diaries and their table talks say, well, you know what, we'll lose the war, but people can at least say that we eliminated the Jews. So there was, and the same was true of the Japanese toward uh, supposedly inferior people in China. They could have occupied China without killing 15 million civilians. And so there were agendas on the Axis side that made no military sense. Joseph Stalin was a mass murderer, but for a brief window during the war, he didn't try to continue the collectivization and the murder of his own people, at least in the way that he had prior to the war. And of course, the United States and the United Kingdom did not either. We did very coercive things, whether it was interring Japanese on the West Coast or some Italians and Germans in the Midwest or in the case of Britain being pretty tough on colonial peoples, but nothing in comparison to what the Third Reich did. Which brings up our last reason why I think the Allies did so well, and that is that they had the more moral cause. They didn't have the perfect cause. You don't have to be perfect to be good, but they were fighting to liberate Europe and Asia from foreign domination that was quite savage and coercive. They weren't fighting to eliminate the British Empire as the way the Americans had perhaps envisioned it, or American corporate presence in foreign lands, but they had a simple argument. If you join us or if you support us,
after the war, it'll be a lot more likely than not that you're not going to be sent to death camps or your labor is not going to be taken from you or you're not going to have your life controlled by Germans or Japanese. And that was a very appealing uh, argument and explains in addition to you know the huge size of the economies and the population and the mound power available to the eventual three allies, it explains why all of occupied Europe that has a theoretical industrial potential larger than the Soviet Union and comparable to the United States is never fully utilized by the Germans. The Germans come into Western Europe to exploit, to steal, to loot, and they're harsh taskmasters. So there's a lot of people in factories that are either working at half speed or sabotaging factories or hiding from German authorities, and there is an active resistance. It's, it's not as credible or large as we were told, but it, it's there. And it also explains another anomaly, and that is why is it when the Americans and the British get into fighting in Burma or in the Philippines or in the Dutch East Indies or Southeast Asia or China, why would it be that Asian peoples look toward colonialists like the British or the Americans, non-Asians, as their kindred allies in a way they don't to fellow Asians like the Japanese? And the answer is that Japanese ideology is considered so brutal and savage, and Western ideology is considered much less savage and in some ways affable and compromising and inviting that they're willing to work with Western foreigners than they are kindred Asians. So ideology and uh, the immorality of the Axis cause turn out to be military, not just ethical or moral liabilities. Let's conclude, though, by looking at what happened in the post-war world. What did, how did each nation fare after the war was over? We can start with the losing side, the Axis. Germany, of course, suffered about five and a half million dead. Its industrial sector, especially in the Ruhr, was devastated. It would essentially have no gross domestic product in the months after the war. It was divided under the tenets of cooperation between the Soviet Union, a resurrected France, Great Britain, and the United States under the Yalta Accords into four zones. So unlike Germany after World War I, it would be divided now into four parts. Soon, the French, British, and American sectors would coalesce into what we call West Germany, and then the Eastern sector would be East Germany, but that's gonna last for 45 years. So Germany will be divided, so it can never regain the preeminence that it did after World War I. And so even though people say, well, the Versailles Treaty was very harsh and caused World War II, nobody says today that the much harsher agreement after World War II was too harsh because there hasn't been another war. So whatever we say about dividing up Germany and, and putting a gun to their head and said, you're going to be democratic, it was considered lenient because there wasn't another war in a way that Versailles, which was much more lenient, was considered harsh because there was a war. So Germany was divided. The landscape was ruined. Five and a half million people were killed. In the post-war era, its two arch enemies, Great Britain and France, were allowed to have nuclear weapons. Germany was not. So today, when we have this anomaly where the, the powerhouse of Europe uh, 80 million people, largest geographical area, does not have nuclear weapons, and a smaller, weaker France and Britain do. Has this kept the peace? The answer, of course, is yes, that Germany was weak right after the war. It was incorporated into NATO. It's now a member of the European Union. It's democratic, and it does not have nuclear weapons. The last point is very important, along with NATO. Remember that the object of NATO was to keep Germany down, Russia out, the United States in. That is pretty much still true. And there is such a thing called the German problem. Since the unification in 1871, for a variety of cultural, social, political, economic reasons, 
Germany makes goods and services that cannot be explained by its population or its geography or its natural resources. There is an innate industriousness and organizational brilliance to the German people, and that has caused problems in Europe. It's causing problems today. German power has reasserted itself. Germany is united. It's the largest country in Europe. It dictates financial terms to southern Mediterranean impoverished nations like Greece or southern Italy or Spain and Portugal. It dictates immigration policy to proud nations like Romania or Hungary or the Czech Republic or Poland and is alien. It dictates the terms of Brexit to the United Kingdom. It dictates to the United States and says we're not going to pay 2% of our GDP for military expenditures. We're going to run up a $65 million surplus with you. So there's this natural reassertion. But because of World War II, there are mechanisms to deal with German pride and success. And they are NATO, the, what became the European Union, and most cynically, the fact that it doesn't have nuclear weapons and its two allies next door do. In fact, there have been people in Germany calling for it to become nuclear. And so a final thing is that, and we're going to see this with Japan, the fact that Germany was destroyed meant it started ex nihilo from a new beginning. So it could replace archaic factories. It could build new roads that were more practical. And that gave it enormous advantages in the post-war era. And the German economy took off in the 1950s. It didn't have to spend any money in defense. It was protected by the United States and NATO. It got huge infusions of Marshall Plan money. And suddenly BMWs and German um, Mercedes and Siemens and pharmaceuticals like Bayer were all over the world again. And today Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world. Same thing is true of Japan. Japan was not invaded. So its actual physical structure did not undergo house-to-house -house fighting. That explains why Japan, with a population roughly the same as Germany, 73 million to 80 million during the war, and engaged, however, a lot longer fighting than China, suffered in aggregate about a million and a half fewer people lost than Germany did because it did not have a bloody ground conflict that went on and on. Out of that destruction, though, Japan faced some of the similar advantages that Germany did. It didn't have to spend money in defense. It was under the American nuclear umbrella. Marshall Plan money poured into Japan. American dictates said you have to empower women, give them the right to vote. You have to have property redistribution. You have to have labor unions. You break up the old landed cartels. All of this was conducive to economic growth. And so we had a similar anomaly where the victors of World War II had empowered the defeated, and now Japan is the third largest economy in the world and has mastered the new rules that were forced down its throat after World War II. In the case of Italy, it's a little bit different. It got off, if I could say lightly, in terms of losing 500,000 and being the battleground of war from 1943 to 1945, it kind of got off lightly in a sense that after the Allies ended the war, they said, you know what, the Soviet Union never got into Italy, so we don't have that problem as we did in Korea or with Germany. And more importantly, the Italians are the only Axis power that threw out their fascist government. In 43, they turned on Mussolini. And then they suffered enough. They were a, battle, uh, a battleground for the longest period of all the Axis power. Japan was never invaded. Germany was only invaded in March, April, and May of 1945. The poor Italians were fought over in July of 43, all of 44, all the way until March of 45. And so they've suffered enough. Let's just not occupy the country. Let's not be punitive. Let's not divide it. There's no need to. So in that sense, they stopped the war early and by their own uh, ability, and they got off lightly. As far as the United States on the winning side, the good thing was that we suffered the least. We inherited a world that was devastated in a sense of trade and commerce. There was no Asian tiger nations, no Korea. There was no Vietnam. There was no Japanese uh, industrial wonder. There was no Germany, there was no China as we have today as a 
as a huge economic juggernaut. There was nobody. They were either destroyed or devastated or in a sense of shock. And so from the period of 1945 to 1960, the United States economy grew leaps and bounds, and we flooded the world with everything from GM trucks to GE refrigerators. We had it all. It was a monopoly. We could do whatever we wanted. That created sort of bad habits. We sort of crystallized labor and capital into a big, huge GM, for example, or Ford and the United Auto Workers. And we had a very affluent period in which union raises were always granted and there was more people hired at GM or General Electric or Goodyear and we were not too efficient. And then you couple that with American idealism in saying we're for free trade, we're gonna have the World Trade Organization and a committee on trade and tariffs and we're going to uh, have a World Bank and the result of all this is we want to have democratic transparency and commerce, trade, and communication worldwide. So we taught the world to be like us, but we were complacent and we were fossilized in thinking we would always have the lifestyle of people in the 1950s. And once Japan and Germany recovered, and they recovered with new industries you know, that came out of nothing, so to speak, they were very efficient and we found that we were no longer competitive by the 1970s and 1980s, which was kind of tragic because people, when I was in high school in the 1970s, said, who won World War II? The Allies or the Axis? Because there's Toyotas, there's Hondas, nobody wants a Chevrolet overseas, the Japanese economy is gonna take over, Germany economy is gonna take over, then it was the EU economy is gonna take over, the Chinese economy, but it was the sense that we always should have the monopoly we had in World War II, and we looked at it as normal when it was an aberration. Final thing with the United States, we had a bad propaganda in the Cold War. Very hard to, to tell the world, you know what, we rebuilt Japan, Italy, and Germany, and they're good guys now. They're demo democracies. So we're still doing what we did in World War II except that the names have changed, the faces have changed, the nations have changed. The Soviet Union is now bad and Germany is good. Well, the Soviet Union and communist China were saying, World War II never ended. We're spreading liberation and fairness and equality. And what did our American and British counterparts do? They traded, they joined the enemy. They're on the German side. Japanese soldiers are patrolling for Americans in 1946 in Korea. Patton wanted to take Nazi soldiers and go into the Soviet Union. So for 20 years, we suffered the consequences of the winners of having to rehabilitate the unpopular losers where the Soviet Union just said, we're still fighting, we're liberating people. That was very hard to, under, to overcome, very difficult. When you look at the United Kingdom, they had the same problem. They had a bad, bad propaganda, but it was compounded by the fact that they had joined the war for the four freedoms in the Atlantic Charter. Freedom of choice, freedom of autonomy, national choice as far as your political system. And yet they had this huge empire in places like Malaya and India and to a lesser degree in Egypt and Iraq. And so these people said, well, wait a minute, you fought to liberate Europe from totalitarianism, you have to free us. And so the British Empire more or less crumbled quite quickly and unexpectedly with grievous economic results, not just for Britain, but for those countries that were not quite prepared for full autonomy. More importantly though, why didn't Britain do what the United States did? They looked at the, a devastated world and they went back to a hyper-capitalist mode and said, we will export and we will capture these markets and at least have 15 or 20 years of prosperity. Well. There was such class tensions, and it was manifested in the loss of the July elections by Winston Churchill in 1945, that Britain began to nationalize its steel industry, its railroad industry, its power industry, its health industry, and the result is that its products, whether it was a Jaguar or an MG, pretty soon were not as competitive as capitalist countries that started anew after the devastation of World War II and had been on the losing side. So Britain sort of shot itself in the foot, at least until the reforms of Margaret Thatcher and lost out on an opportunity to be the twin juggernaut of the Western world and the victorious allies that would speed up a global recovery. Finally, the Soviet Union. 
Soviet Union before 1939 was reeling. These successive five-year programs had not worked. The collectivization of farms and the extermination of the Kulak class had destroyed Soviet productivity. It created near civil war. Many Ukrainians greeted the Nazis as terrible as they were as liberators. The purges, the officer trials had slowly began to erode left-wing support in Western democracies for the Soviet Union. In other words, it was considered a fraud. It, it didn't work. It was violent. It was savage. It was worse than Hitler in the 30s. And people in England and America even, not just right-wingers, but centrists and even left-wingers said, you know what? As bad as Hitler is in 1936 or seven or 38, as bad as Mussolini, they haven't killed as many as Stalin. So one of the artifacts of World War II was that when Hitler went in in 1941 on June 21st, and he began to butcher so many Russians, and then they lost so many people and they destroyed uh, German ground forces, there was a new empathy, a new recalibration uh, naivete after the war. And so the Soviet Union got a second lease on life and strategically it now had the Warsaw Pact of six nations right on the border of Europe in a way that was not true before World War II. So, and it was able to undermine the Chiang Kai-shek government. It added China to the orbit. I said earlier it had a, a very convincing propaganda. And so for 50 years, the Soviet Union was given oxygen as a result of World War II, and it survived. It flooded the world with T-34 tanks. It flooded the world with uh, assault weapons, RPG, all coming out of the vast stockpiles of weaponry and technology as a result of World War II. So they came off far better. Had there not been World War II, the Soviet Union might have at least imploded or had civil unrest in a way that would have ended the government far before 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Finally, is there any pithy short phrase, sentiment, conclusion that we can make about World War II that would sum up the entire tragedy? That is the tragedy of how relatively weak powers bullied their way from 1939 to 1941 to control most of Asia and Europe and then required a lot of death and destruction and tragedy to unseat them from power by 1945. I think there is. World War II can be summed up in the following terms. It was a result of American isolationism, British appeasement, and Russian collusion that allowed fascism to grow and thrive. In other words, war is a laboratory before a war takes place, we all know which nations are strong economically and militarily, and, and they have certain spheres of influence. If you confuse that knowledge, if you say Britain is weak because it appeases, the United States is weak because it's isolationism, Russia is weak because it's collusing, then you confuse relative assessment. And war breaks out as an arbiter, a laboratory. It tells us what's really true. World War II then was the ultimate laboratory of death. It told us in 1945 what we should have known in 1939, that it's a very stupid thing to fight a war against the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union. But tragically, due to isolationism, appeasement, and collusion, it took 65 million deaths to prove what should have been self-evident. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses podcast. If you want to continue learning about World War II or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu forward slash course. There you can find over 40 free online courses, including American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hanson, C.S. Lewis on Christianity, Ancient Christianity, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness 
at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening.